Welcome back. Getting more Canadians to travel domestically and also encouraging international travel here isn't just about pricing, but also about creativity. Ricky Zhang is the founder of Prince of Travel. Thanks for being with us, Ricky. Thanks for having me. So I, I want to, I mean, as somebody who understands kind of travelers and destinations, what is it that you think makes somebody choose one place over another? So for me, it's obviously a lot of the times down to the individual's preference, but there's definitely prevailing trends in terms of destinations that are always going to be popular, um, whether at certain times of year or just the, the travel zeitgeist brings people to a certain set of destinations um, or places that are you know highly popular uh, just based on the trends so as of late you've seen obviously europe in the summer is super popular but also um, during the rest of the year lots of attention on japan in the past couple of years just because it had been closed for so long and since it reopened it's been it's been all the rage it's been very affordable for north americans to head over there and enjoy their their holidays so definitely uh, a lot of trends to follow in the travel space. What's the best way to attract travelers to Canadian destinations? Yeah, if we're talking about domestic destinations within Canada, I think historically it's been uh, a struggle to get Canadians traveling domestically, um, visiting places they may have not been to before compared to going internationally. I know Canadians were, you know, we're well-traveled people. We enjoy seeing the world, but there's a lot of gems to be discovered within our own backyard as well. And historically, the costs there have been difficult. I know there's been a lot of work put in by the local, regional, provincial tourism boards to, as you said, uh, work at work the marketing channels, work with influencers, and get the word out more about the sites that are available to be seen uh, within the country. And for the uh, the airlines and the loyalty programs part, I know for for sure, for example, Air Canada and WestJet have been touting the uh, the attractiveness of certain deals to places like Atlantic Canada or Alberta to get Canadians exploring their backyard a little bit more. And of course, you mentioned you know there's been an increase uh, in, in travel to places like Europe. We know after the pandemic, Canadians are eager to get back to the U.S. as well. Um, is there kind of a uh, an echo chamber effect when people, because uh, it does seem as though all of a sudden you hear everybody's going to Portugal or at a certain point everybody was in Tuscany. Uh, is, is, that, is that because we're seeing it online and uh, or is it more likely to be the airlines have good deals to those destinations and people are gravitating towards the, the lower dollar? Yeah, I think there's definitely some truth to what you said there about uh, what we see online and the types of popular travel experiences that are glamorized. Um, I know, for example, uh, there was this recent phenomenon in Barcelona where the locals have had enough of of tourists. Um, mm -hmm. It's basically you know, affected the local living experience so much, and it's increased the cost of living uh, by by a lot over there. And you also factor in things like uh, remote work being more popular these days, and this phenomenon of of digital nomads and traveling and working, you know, at the same time. And so in Barcelona, there was locals kind of protesting this and squirting water guns at the tourists, which, you know, not necessarily the best experience. So it's definitely uh, a lot of what I would call like a, a bit of a flattening of the travel landscape, where people are tend to be drawn to the same types of destinations from what they're seeing online. And in the summertime, a lot of that is happening in Europe. So Portugal, Barcelona, Italy, mm -hmm. um, packed with tourists right now. Are you seeing more travelers therefore starting to ask for remote destinations, experiences that aren't gonna be really crowded with other people? With the masses of tourists heading to certain places, everybody's kind of always looking for like the next frontier, the next cool place to go to. Um, Croatia comes to mind as an example over the past, you know, three to five years, certainly from the last couple of years before the pandemic as well. Uh, one of those, you know, originally lesser travel places, but definitely very beautiful, very picturesque and very popular among, you know, people who are not necessarily first time travelers, but they've been around the world a bit more. And if you're going to Europe, and want to avoid the crowds. Uh, Croatia and in general, the rest of Eastern Europe is trending upwards in terms of popularity. Great to have you for this, Ricky. Appreciate your time today. Thank you, Amanda. Ricky Zhang is founder of Prince of Travel.
time for the takeaway. And if you build it, the federal government has a national tourism strategy. And that makes sense, given what a big and vibrant sector travel and tourism is for the Canadian economy. Growing the sector means increasing the number of jobs in direct and related fields. And there are sensible ideas about extending the tourism in places that are highly seasonal. It also makes sense to consider our marketing effort to international visitors, since that represents a serious pool of potential growth, given that the vast majority of tourism in this country is currently by Canadians from one part visiting another. But when it comes to big dollars and a big return, Canada would do well to recognize an important fact. Things that make the country more appealing to visitors also happen to make it more livable for those who live there. As much as Niagara Falls and the Rocky Mountains may show up on postal cards, big cities remain the largest destination for tourism. Toronto, Vancouver and Montreal, top of the list. Improving transit in those cities, just for a start, would be a big benefit. Solving the terrible traffic issues of those cities would also help. And while we're talking about things that make a place more enjoyable, reducing crime is also something that has tangible benefits to residents and visitors alike. In other words, if we clean up our own house, not only do we get to enjoy it more, but visitors will appreciate it too. Beyond those fundamental issues, government support of small businesses in the sector remains essential, and a strategy for our entire hospitality sector would encompass tourism efforts as well as boost local economies and create jobs. And importantly, small businesses started by new Canadians can act as ambassadors for international visitors. My takeaway? Perhaps the most important way to think of tourism in Canada is not just as a key sector, but one that is intimately related to the whole economy and our quality of life. That's Taking Stock for this week. I'm Amanda Lang. Thanks for being with us.